But I do have to say that there was a part of me that by like just not having anything, it was such an amazing source of freedom. You know, I think that, and as I get older, my, my belief in religion is I believe in all religions. Boucher Rahman is a poet, novelist, and cultural activist. She is the daughter of Pakistani immigrants, and her novel, Corona, is a dark comedy about a South Asian American, about being South Asian American, queer, and Muslim in Queens, New York. Rahman is co-editor of an absolutely fabulous anthology that's being reissued called Colonize This! Exclamation point, Young Women of Color on Today's Feminism. Her first book of poetry, which is what we have out in the back, is Mariana's Beauty Salon, and it came out last year. And because writing novels, poetry, and editing is not enough, she's now doing a young adult fiction called Corona Stories of a Queen's Girlhood, which will soon be published. Um, her writing merges her life experience and her political activism. Um, her work feels deeply personal, but also universal. Um, it, it breaks open stereotypes. It asks us to see one another in a new way. And I think, again, at this moment in time, that's just such vital work. So thank you, Bushra. Um, so I thought I would start with um, some uh, love poems because let's just ease into it, slow and easy. Although, as we know, love is not slow and easy. And um, for those of you who, like me who weathered many a heartbreak, uh, you'll, you'll realize that a lot of my love poems are actually heartbreak poems. And it's because when I'm actually in love, I'm too busy being in love to write. And then it's when I'm out of love that I'm just like going to Rumi and Neruda and getting inspiration and just like writing my heart out. Oh, OK, you don't need that. Um, so oh, I don't really need it. It's that's the notes that I will no longer use. Um, all right, so this first poem is called At the Museum of Natural History. Have any of you been there, the Dinosaur Museum? So it's, it's a place that one of my exes invited me once, and you know, we were in a complicated, we were in a complicated, like, let me put this down here. We were in like a very complicated relationship for many, many years, and we were friends, and so it was hard to break up, and anytime we break up, we'd start hanging out again, and it lasted for too long. Um, and at this point, he asked me to go to the museum with him, and I was like, that's cool, there's security there, you know, they'll stop any kind of crazy fights that happen. Um, and it's also inspired by a Rumi line called, love is a tyrannous prince. Is the sound okay? Yeah? Okay. Um, as we both look up at the Tyrannosaurus Rex, its bones painted black, its danger extinct, I can hear the sound of children echo throughout the museum. And we're not afraid this way to stand a few inches away from each other. We're not afraid because it's over. The Tyrannosaurus Rex doesn't scare us and we don't scare each other. It's over. The bones are beginning to fade and bleach in our failure. But if one day someone finds our bones and decides to lay them right next to each other, Will they lay them in their proper ways? Will they mix up my hip with yours? Will they place the fingers of my hands on someone else's palms? Will they ever know that this flesh answered to the other? That my fingers traveled all over the empty space around your bones? So that was that. Um, <laughs> heartache, I highly recommend writing during heartache and I highly recommend um, reading Rumi, the Arbery translation specifically, and just pulling lines. That's what I used to do is just like pull random lines of Rumi and then just write. So that last one was from Love is a Tyrannous Prince, Rumi line. And here's another Rumi line that was the other poem written by this person. So basically it was like a, I guess now they say non-binary. It was like we were two bi people in an open relationship in New York City in the 90s. It was just like too much. Um, but uh, this one is called, uh, Your Lock is More Delightful to Me Than a Hundred Keys. And it's the ones for the real toxic relationships that you're like, you can't get out of. Um, it's the missing clasp of your body that shudders me awake. And before I fall asleep, I replay all the tightly wound metal of our kisses, all the ways our bodies resisted, all the ways we came unhinged. Let a thousand doors fall from their places, a thousand bees fly from their nests. And then, um, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, but you know, I do think that all that heartache, if you learn from it, you can eventually get to a place where you're like, aha, I see that red flag. It's a giant freaking red flag. <laughs> Let me just stay away from that. And, um, and, 
and I, I've now been with my partner for like over 10 years. We have a kid. We've been through so much. Um, and I think that there's a way that someone told me that we should do, like me and this other friend should do a panel on how to have like long relationships when you're like in community and, you know, activists and all that stuff. And I feel like one of the things I would say on the panel is that a long relationship, you have to think of it as a phoenix dying and being reborn again and again, you know? The key is to know whether it's a phoenix or a zombie pigeon. Um, then you don't know. But like, I do think that there is a way that um, I, I do find <laughs> that that's what happens for us. And this poem was written some time ago. Um, and it's, you know, and I think that, you know, money is often like one of the things that couples fight about the most. And we were both two working artists, don't come from trust funds, like, and often we wouldn't have money and um, not even know how we were going to pay the rent, you know. And so at this point, our car broke down and we didn't even, like, I don't even think we had renewed our triple A or whatever. And so we just, like, left it on the side of the road and just walked home. <laughs> And uh, so this is called, um, and we've come such a long way. I sent it to him this morning being like, honey, we've come a long way. Um, but uh, it's called The Car. As the car slows down to the stop, the darkness swells around us. We are on the edge. All is quiet. It's been a month of everything falling apart. We make our way home in the pitch black dark. Do not talk. I draw myself a bath. Think of my parents, how little money they had how little money we have now. One day this era will be called a depression, but tonight we beat ourselves against the walls for being so broke, for the car we must leave on the side of the road. Easy enough to forget we are being sucked dry by vultures. Easy enough to forget there is a war. But quiet now, lay down beside him. Forget, turn on the 70s soul. Love him on the bed, still in your towel. Let it all ease out. Forget there is not enough money, not enough money to pay the rent in the house. So thank you. Um, and I'm not saying that like money leads to happiness because look at Donald Trump. I mean, he's like such a great example about how like you could have so much money and be like maybe one of the unhappiest people around. Um, but I do think and people have proven that there is a certain level of money that we need to have to live a certain quality of life to not break down, you know? And I think about, um, you know, how I grew up. I grew up in Corona, which is a very under-resourced neighborhood in Queens. Um, um, immigrant neighborhood in Queens and, uh, you know, the kind of fighting and tension and violence that would happen amongst people of color, I, I feel like was so much a part of just how much we were all struggling, you know? Um, and I think that it's the same with the, the backlash that's happening in this country right now. Like, people are struggling. And when you struggle financially, um, you know, you look for scapegoats, you get angry, you get tired, you're exhausted, you know? And, and that leads to just um, all kinds of, of horror. So, um, I don't know where I'm going with that. I'll just read a poem. Um, but, uh, you know, I th so this poem is called Rapunzel's Mother or a Pakistani Woman Newly Arrived in America. And uh, you all know the story of Rapunzel, yes? I think they call it Tangled now for your generation. Um, but, uh, you know, the thing with that story, if you read one of the original Grimm fairy tales, the reason that she's in that tower is that um, her mother was pregnant and was hungry and they lived next to a um, witch uh, and uh, they, the, and the witch grew like great vegetables because she was a witch and she had magical powers. And so the, the wife was like, I'm so hungry. I want some of those witch's vegetables. And her husband went and got it. And um, that's how they ended up like she had to, he, caught, he got caught. And so she had to give up their firstborn child. Like that's one of the, that's the, the backstory of why she's in that tower in the first place. And I often think of that as a metaphor for growing up with immigrant parents because the way my parents grew up, um, like food, there was definitely food scarcity and they struggled. And when she first came here, there would be all these pictures of her like in the grocery store, like posing next to like the aisles of food, you know, and sending it, you know, like, like just being like, wow, this is amazing. And um, I found this one picture of her with me pregnant and I um, wrote this poem about it called Rapunzel's Mother, a Pakistani Woman Newly Arrived in America. Um, with a cabbage, a box of eggs so clean, she could easily forget the source of their existence. My mother filled her silver cart and moved in line to make her purchase. The cashier turned a sharp glance at the small brown woman with the pierced nose and covered head. She didn't fit into this, an American supermarket. And what, asked the cashier, are you willing to pay for this? She held the head of lettuce in the air. It reflected off her rhinestone glasses and the hairspray in her hair. But this, said my mother, is America. I thought there was no barter here. Hmm, said the cashier. There's give and take all over the world. What made you think it would be different here? 
She shook her head in her plastic hair. But I have money. My mother tried to act like she didn't care. Her English broke all over her and fell apart in the air, but the cashier cackled, no, 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 my dear. What I want is here. And she pointed a nail, silver painted and crooked, at my young mother's stomach, which I had just begun to share. That's the price you'll have to pay, my dear, for this fresh lettuce. Each egg that erupts into a new-blown head shall be the property of this here supermarket, country, and nation. And don't even think of running, because we've got the goods on you. Along with every other immigrant, we've got your passport, your foreign passport, right here. She made to reach into her too tight jeans. My mother, she ran out of there. The shopping girl openly laughed behind her, and the lines and lines of customers just stood there with their stupid grins. My mother ran. The door opened by itself. My mother ran, but she still found herself in a foreign land far away from home. And I, thank you. And I think about that because, you know, as children, we turned out to be quite different than what our parents wanted. Not all of us, there's six of us and they did well with four of them. And uh, two of us are black sheep and we hang out together all the time, me and my other sister. And, but I do think that that was a trade-off that they didn't expect. And I don't think they even knew what to expect. Um, but I, you know, I went many years without talking to my family. I was like a runaway. It turned out later, I ran away from home when I was like 20. And I ran to San Francisco and I was homeless. And, and I found out later from one of my friends who's a youth worker there that I was a homeless youth. And I was like, but I was 20. I was like all adult. She's like, no, you're technically a youth when you were 20. Um, but so I, I think, but with my family now, you know, we talk, we hang, there's been healing. That's what I think is so amazing about getting older um, is the way you can circle back to your families after troubled, troubled years as you all get older and, and more compassionate and basically too tired to fight. Um, and recently I hung out with my mom and uh, she just had surgery so I've been spending a lot of time with her. And I said, what was it like for you when you moved to, um, we grew up in, we, we spent most of our time in Queens and then they moved to New Jersey when I was 16. And uh, I said, what did you feel like when you were, moved here? And she was like, I felt bored and afraid. <laughs> and so I was like, that's such a great way to explain like, an immigrant experience, like I was bored because of all the social activities you're missing from back home. And I was afraid. Um, and uh, I think that one of the ways that she compensated was just by watching Bollywood movies all the time. Does anyone here watch Bollywood movies at all? Um, she would like, one thing she would do is she would like actually tape the movies to make illegal bootlegs for my uncle's store that he would then sell in his store. But so she would, so the movies would be playing like nonstop in our house. And this is VCR days. so you couldn't digitally, like you had to basically play the movie from beginning to end to make the copy. Um, and then she had to give him the video. So what she would do is keep, put a tape recorder, there's like a whole copyright free zone in my house. Like she would put a tape recorder next to the TV and tape the songs that she liked. Um, but if any of you have ever taped, you know that it, it can ca catch the background noise and everything else. So I actually found one of those tapes and I played it and I, I listened to us as children in the background, which was really eerie. Um, and, you know, and my mom was, you know, she really suffered in, in many ways and, and she really kind of, I have a more compassion for it now, but she really took it out on the children. I mean, there were six of us and it was just her and it was just like a one bedroom apartment. I mean, just like craziness, right? So um, it was in intense to, to listen to these tapes. And this poem is called Ami's Cassettes and Ami is what we call mother. Um, the other day I found my mother's cassettes from the 80s. They were full of love songs from Indian movies. Ami used to tape them from the TV while she cleaned. And I thought back um, to the orange carpets, because we all used to have orange carpets. <laughs> the sofas with their plastic, the way everything was dusted and perfect. I tried to fill the memory with her music, to come up with something peaceful, something splendid. But the tapes, they just didn't play that way. You see, they caught all the background noise, the sound of babies crying, children fighting, fire engines going, and then the sound of a child being hit. The children wouldn't stop making noise until my mother's own voice would break. Then there would be nothing but the sound of her crying and the sound of music in a language my mother was dying to hear. And I thought back to the orange carpets and the way I would press my face against them and against the plastic sofas until the perspiration would make it stick and listen to the sound of her crying and all the love songs of longing. They promised everything missing in that house with its orange carpets, everything missing in the plastic everything she ever recorded. So, thank you. I guess I get the recording gene from my mom then. You know, she was a documenter in her own way. Um, I'll read one more poem and then if there's time, maybe I'll read a last one. Um, 
And, and then I'm excited to hear your questions and have a conversation. So this poem is called Masjid. And, you know, I woke up this morning and the news alert was that all houses of worship needed to be on high, high alert, you know. And it was just so upsetting. Um, you know, there was a, a second shooting at a synagogue. There was, there's been shootings at temples, at churches, at, at gay nightclubs, which I consider holy places. You know, I think that there was a, a, a way that this high alert is, is so horrible. Um, and when I grew up, yes, there was tension, but there was also a religious tolerance, which for Queens, I mean, like literally you had like so many religions and so many people living next to each other um, peacefully most of the time. And my father, actually, and he didn't even realize this, he was part of creating the first uh, masjid or, or mosque, like a Muslim house of worship in New York City in the 70s and 80s. And he didn't even know that he was making that. He just knew he needed a place to pray. And so him and his friends, um, all working class Pakistanis, like slowly, slowly raised the money. And over 20 years, they built this masjid. And the thing that makes it historically significant is that it's one of the first buildings made to look like a mosque. So it has like a minar, you know, that tower, and it has a dome. Um, like any place could be a masjid. Like this room could become a masjid if we just pray in it. Like any place can be a holy place. But this was the first place um, in New York City that was made architecturally to look like a, a masjid. Um, and it's called Masjid al and it exists in Corona, Queens. Um, Masjid. Let me see if I can do this one off book. Um, the minar and dome of our masjid took longer to grow than trees. Our fathers bought the land, then tilled it. Before that, it was a parking lot for our neighbors, the Jehovah's Witness, who sold it to us when the door-to-door -door wasn't bringing in enough donations. Our fathers sowed the seeds then, Budans and Janamazes. And in all my years, from when I was 4 to 16, the walls went up, and then the dome grew the same pace my breasts did. The minar, too, grew to reach the queen's sky, pick, push up past the telephone lines, let itself poke up, respectful still of the Episcopalian church steeple next to it, and the flat brick surface of the kingdom of the Jehovah's Witness. It was fine real estate for religion on National Street, a church, a kingdom, and a masjid, crammed next to each other, wall to wall and skin to skin. And if you crossed the street, there was a Catholic store selling crucifixes and paintings of women and men in hell burning. The sinners looked like all of us. But I always thought that all of us, in our agony, looked like Jesus. Okay. Do I have time for one more? Do one more? Okay. Um, so I, let's see where this poem is. I just thought I'd read it because, like, whenever I come to college, I'm just like, oh, everyone has their book bags. Um, and, you know, when I ran away from home, I just had my book bag. Um, and, uh, and I had a few other things, but they all got stolen on the Greyhound. Um, and then... This last book bag got stolen at some point, and I was just, it was like a very intense for me because it was really the last kind of reminder. Um, but I do have to say, not that I'm encouraging people to run away from home, but I do have to say that there was a part of me that by like just not having anything, it was such an amazing source of freedom. You know, I think that, and as I get older, my, my belief in religion is that I believe in all religions um, and thus believe in none, but then believe in all of them at the same time. Um, but I think what I move towards, moving towards more and more in my life is a way of just having nothing and um, just trying to be more, more zen and meditate and, and things like that. So I feel like I was already reaching that when I lost, had absolutely no personal positions at all at this point in my life. Um, book bag stolen March 14th. Some people say it's dumb to get attached to things, but you know sometimes you really can't help it. When you've got a thing and it's got all, when, you can, when you've got a thing and it's so many times it's been the only thing you've got, when you can turn to it and say, it's just you and me, kid, and then laugh a lot, you know, you're never really alone when you've got a thing you can carry around, when the thing itself carries your toothbrush, your socks, because you never know where you're gonna end up. I mean, what are you supposed to do? How can you not get attached when it's the only thing that's taught you the lesson of what was essential and what was not? You say, I don't need anyone now. I've got my things, you don't know how or where I'm going and you can't come along, but my book bag can. I mean, what are you supposed to do? When there's always, how can you not get attached? When there's always a diary handy, condoms, pencils, and pens, scraps of addresses of people to whom you never give a thought. Of course, you're always pulling the scraps up every time you're trying to get change for cigarettes or the bus or the toll-free number of your advisor in New York. But mostly change, the condoms just dust and rot. I mean, maybe my book bag heard me the day I was in David's garden and said, I'm going to stop moving around. I don't care about having adventures anymore. I just want a home and a garden, and I'm so tired, I don't even care if it sounds like a magazine. I said no more traveling, and I know my book bag heard me. Why else would it have disappeared? 
Somehow, though, it's been happening lately. My jeans wore out, my boots hurt when I walk, and I called long distance yesterday to mourn the loss. All of us old friends separate and falling off with antidepressants and Valium and marriage. It is such a sin to be lonely, one friend asked. It is, I said, it is. I called them all. You know how it is. Some people say it's dumb to get attached to things. But you know sometimes you really can't help it when you've got a thing, and so many times it's been the only thing you've got. So <laughs> I'll stop there. And so excited to hear the next reader, who we're having a reunion after almost 20 years. Right? Something like that? Yeah.